So, <clears throat> if you will recall, we have started this chapter already. Chapter 8 is a chapter on bonding. Okay, what are the two types of bonds out there? Ionic and covalent, okay? We have started talking about ionic already, and we're going to wrap that section up, and then we're going to move into covalent. The bulk of chapter 8 is on covalent. Remember that that includes drawing Lewis structures, shapes, that kind of thing. Okay, but let's finish up this ionic portion. And first of all, we're talking an ionic compound. That means we're talking about ions, things with positive charges, cations and anions. And if you were able to put some kind, some ionic compound under a very powerful microscope and look at its structure, because ionic compounds do have a very um, specific kind of structure, you would see the positive ions, the cations, surrounding themselves with negative charges, the anions. And if you zeroed in on one of the anions, you would see that it was surrounding itself by all these positive charges. And when they align like that, you get a structure called a crystalline lattice. Not lettuce, lattice. Okay. And I've got a model here of just, just one example. There's all kinds of structures out there, but this is just an example of one. And when I say a crystalline lattice, it doesn't mean like, you know, necessarily a cube on top of a cube on top of a cube. They can have all kinds of different structures. A crystalline lattice just means a regular repeating pattern, okay, like this one. And in this model, these little black pieces would represent the atoms and the little green pieces would represent the bonds. Okay? But they have a very regular repeating pattern kind of structure. And they are, just for your understanding, mostly solids at room temperature. And when we're talking about this lattice, this crystalline lattice, we can also talk about something called the lattice energy. And it gives us an indication, knowing the number for something's lattice energy between a metal and a nonmetal, the bonds between them, gives us an indication of how tight, how strong that bond is. Okay? And I want to just review with you a second a term that we talked about at the beginning of this chapter. For those of you that have the slides, there was a slide that had the title Bond Energy. The term bond energy we defined, and listen really carefully to how it's defined, how this is worded. The energy required to break a bond. Bond energy is the energy required to break a bond. Does that sound like an endo or exothermic process? Endo. Energy is required. You must put energy in to break a bond. So if breaking a bond is an endothermic process, what do you think forming a bond is? Exo. That's what lattice energy is. Energy released when a bond forms. Okay? Bond energies are positive, endo. Lattice energies are negative, they're exo. Okay? And depending on how negative it is, tells us how strong this ionic bond is. Now, this is an equation which you do not need to memorize. It is not on your equation sheet. I'm only using it um, to help you understand this concept a little better. Okay? But this equation should look familiar to you. 
we, when we started chapter 8, we looked in an equation that was called Coulomb's Law. And it was basically a mathematical way for me to prove to you why opposite charges attract. Okay, it's almost the same equation. Don't memorize it. The most important thing here is this Q1 and Q2 parts. Okay? These are the charges of the ions in a compound. So I'm going to give you an example. Let's say we're comparing two different salts, NaCl, sodium chloride, and how about aluminum chloride? And I ask you the question, which one has the more negative or the more exothermic lattice energy? Well, tell me this. In this compound, what is sodium's charge? Plus one, okay. And chlorine, when it's in a compound? Minus one. How about aluminum in a compound? Plus three, and chlorine is negative one again. I'm gonna multiply these. One times negative one is negative one. Three times negative one is negative three. Do you agree that multiplying the charges for aluminum chloride gives me a more negative answer? Do you agree? Okay. That means that aluminum chloride will have the more negative lattice energy, the more exothermic energy. And in our, the, the best way to understand this is that means the bond, that ionic bond between aluminum and chlorine is tighter, stronger than the bond between sodium and chlorine. Let's extend this concept a little bit. What if you were asked the question, which one of these salts has a higher melting point? What are you doing when you melt? Something. Dinner. I know, but what chemically are you doing? Breaking bonds. You're just breaking bonds. Which one of these has a bond that's harder to break? Which one? Come on, people. Aluminum chloride. I know that because it has the more negative lattice energy. Aluminum chloride is then going to have the higher melting point. Okay. And let's talk about some wording here. Okay. Because guys, we are still in a time of this, of this school year where a lot of our test questions and problem set questions are going to be not calculations. They're going to be explain why those two sentence maximum kind of questions, okay? This is how you phrase it, okay? If I had that example, again, that sodium chloride versus aluminum chloride, and the question said, which compound has the more negative lattice energy? You would say aluminum chloride because don't show this equation, or you don't have to. You don't even have to say anything about multiplying the charges. This is what you say. Aluminum chloride would have the more exothermic lattice energy because it contains the more highly charged ions. That's how you get around saying no, plus one times negative one is negative one. Plus three times negative one is, ne is negative three. Don't get into any of that. You don't have to. All you say is this one has more highly charged ions, period. So we're still in this time of year where we're talking about how to phrase things. So, here are some practice 
sequence. In each one, I want you to pretend that this is like a free response question. One of those two sentence maximum kind of questions. Tell me which one has the more exothermic lattice energy and why. Go. Okay, let's talk it out. Okay? First one. <coughs> Which one has the more negative lattice energy? Everybody. MGO. And how would you explain why an AP Chem Lingo? Contains more what? Highly charged ions. Good. Okay. How about the second one? Which one? Okay. Good. For the same reason. This has more highly charged ions than this one. Number three is a little tricky. Why is it tricky, first of all? Yeah, they have the same charged ions. Strontium is plus two, iodine is negative one. Sodium is plus one, oxygen is negative two. We get the same product. Okay, so let's think about, the answer is not they have the same. Let's think about it. If you all look at, take a look at that equation which I told you not to memorize, okay, it's just there for your information. There is a lowercase r in the denominator, and it's radius, distance between the two nuclei of these, at, these ions, okay? Here's the thought process. Let's compare the metals. I realize that these metals are not in the same group. But, just look at where they are. Sodium, strontium. Which one is larger? Strontium. Strontium is two entire energy levels larger. What about, and again, I know they're not in the same group, but iodine versus oxygen, one of these is clearly bigger than the other. Which one? Iodine. Okay. This is two big fat ions bonded together. This is two teeny tiny little ions bonded together. And think about it, guys. Remember, lattice energy gives us an indication of how tight things are held together. Two things that are close to each other or two things that are far apart from each other. Just think about it common sense. Which do you think would make for a tighter bond? Close together or far apart? Close together. Now, mathematically, the reason is because the distance between these two ions is a small number compared to this one. And the distance is in the denominator of that equation. When you divide by a small number, your quotient is a larger quantity number. So we're getting a more negative answer with this one. So that's the answer. So, to be clear, there was no need to talk about radius in numbers one and two. One and two were just charged, you know, this one was more highly charged, this one had more highly charged ions. In number three, however, you'd say, although they contain the same charged ions, the distance between, or you know what would be better, <clears throat> is I would say the sodium oxide compound contains ions with smaller radii. That's what I would say. Or the distance between these two ions is smaller than the distance between strontium and iodine. Something along those lines. Either distance or radius. We are now ready to transition into talking about covalent bonds. And let's just recap here for a minute, okay? I want you guys to understand why atoms bond in the first place. And I don't care if it's ionic or covalent, the reason is the same, okay? Can you please tell me what family of elements on the periodic table, does every element want to be like? Yes. Noble gases. What's so special about the noble gases? Yes. Okay, a full octet of valence electrons, eight, makes them very stable. 
Now please understand, ionic and covalent, both kinds, the atoms are trying to achieve that noble gas configuration, and that's why they bond. The difference is what the atoms do to achieve that configuration. In ionic, one thing gives away an electron and the other element takes it. It's a full transfer. In covalent, both atoms are achieving that configuration, but the electrons are not given and taken, they're shared. And in a covalent bond, guys, there's a lot of forces going on. Okay. The electrons of one atom are attracted to the nucleus of the other. Why would that be? Why would electrons be attracted to the nucleus? They're, yeah, they're oppositely charged. Okay. The electrons are repelling each other. The nuclei are repelling each other. There's a lot of forces going on here. And we talked about this briefly at the beginning of the chapter. A bond length is determined when that energy between them is at a minimum. And I gave you that analogy of a relationship, okay? If you find the love of your life, you wanna be close to them, but you don't wanna to be too close, okay? Then you start getting forces of repulsion when these various forces of attraction and repulsion balance out, that's when the bond length is determined. Now, we need to talk about polarity, which should be review from Chem 1. And I want to make sure that you understand that talking about polarity is a concept that we only discuss with covalent bonds. Okay. And I want to draw you a picture, because I'm a very visual person. The pictures help me. Okay, I'm going to draw a bond between two elements. And I'm going to use letters that are not real elements, like A and X. Okay? I've got element A and element X. Okay? And I'm going to draw the electrons for element A. I'm going to draw them as X's. I'm going to draw the electrons for element X as little dots. Okay? Would you agree that both elements have eight electrons around them? Yes. Okay? Is that what they want? Yep. They're happy. They're good. Okay? These, this electron pair is being shared, so this is a covalent bond, and I tried to draw this as best I could. That electron pair is equidistant between these two elements. Okay? That means this pair of electrons is being shared evenly, equally. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a nonpolar bond. Electrons are being shared, but they're being shared equally. Let me try to draw a polar situation. electrons, eight electrons. They are still sharing this pair. Does it look like it's equidistant though? No. Looks to me like this pair is a little bit closer to X than to A. That is a polar bond. Okay. It's still sharing a pair of electrons, but they're not being shared evenly or equally. One of, the one of the atoms is hogging this pair of electrons. Sure. Okay. Now, tell me this. Electrons are negative or positive? Negative. 
if the negative, these negative electrons are being pulled more to the right hand side, that means this bond is going to be slightly more negative on the right hand side and a little bit positive on the left hand side. Okay. That's why it's called polar. They have poles. These bonds have poles. This one doesn't. It's equal. This one does. And if I was going to draw an ionic bond, it would, I really wouldn't even draw it out, but just for understanding, and X would be like over here, okay? There's no sharing going on here. Now, this is not a perfect drawing because this guy doesn't have an office stable octet, but the point is shared evenly, shared unevenly, not shared at all. Okay? And guys, it is a progression. There is a gradual progression here. There is, there really isn't a point at which you say, okay, this bond is polar covalent. And boom, all of a sudden, it's ionic. There's no sharing anymore. There's really no hard and fast point. It is a transition. And I will talk more about that in just a second. If that makes no sense to you, don't stress. I will come back to that. Now, you guys have a choice in some vocabulary here. You may either say that a bond is polar, or if you want to be really fancy, you can say that this bond has a dipole moment. You choose, they mean the exact same thing. Okay. And I just want you to be aware of this sort of um, notation here. If you see an arrow like this with a little plus sign on the end, the arrow is pointing to the element that is hogging that shared pair of electrons. So if I was going to draw them in, I would draw them like this, closer to the fluorine than the hydrogen. Okay, the arrow points to the element that is attracting the electrons more. The reason there's a little plus sign is because this side of the bond is more negative, this side is more positive. Okay. Now, how do you know? Which element is going to attract the electrons more? Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a concept that you should have learned in Chem 1 called electronegativity. Okay. And I want to be very clear on making sure that you understand what this word means and how it is different from the term electron affinity. They are very similar in their definition. And the key difference in their definition is this word right here, share. This is the most important word. Both electronegativity and electron affinity, both of them mean the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself. Here's the difference. Electronegativity is an atom that is already tied up in a covalent bond. It's not just any old electrons that it's attracting to itself. It's attracting the electrons that are being shared between it and something else. Okay. Electron affinity is an atom just by itself, hanging out. It's not in a bond. It's just an element by itself. How much does it want to attract electrons to itself? This is an atom tied up in a chemical bond. Now, if you would please, you should have a book in front of you, go to page 334. 334. On page 334, there is a chart that has numbers in it. Those numbers 
are called Pauling electronegativity values. Do you need to memorize this chart? Absolutely not. Okay. And in fact, you probably won't ever use a chart like this. We're just going to use it today to illustrate a point. Okay. But what I would like for you to do, pick a row. I don't care what row it is. Pick a row in that chart and scan your eyes from left to right. I want you to notice, in general, it's not perfect, there are a couple of little hiccups, but in general, the values increase from left to right. The electronegativity increases from left to right. Why would that be? Think about some of the answers you wrote on our most recent test. What are, what is the reason for anything changing from left to right? Increasing number of protons, which causes what to get stronger? James. Okay, well, what else? Okay, well, the energy level is staying the same. Sarah? The ratio is not changing at all. The number of protons is increasing, which Meg causes what? There you go. The effective nuclear charge to get stronger. Okay? And if that effective nuclear charge is getting stronger, doesn't it make sense that that source of that pole, the nucleus, would be attracting electrons more and more and more? Okay? Pick a column in that chart. Doesn't matter what column it is. Pick one. Please notice that the values tend to decrease as you move from top to bottom. What's the reason that anything changes from top to bottom? Yes, James? Increasing number of energy levels, which causes the effective nuclear charge to decrease or get weaker. Okay. Now, please notice that in this chart, there, the noble gases aren't even on the chart. They're not even on it. And let's think about that for a second. Since noble gases are all the way on the right-hand side, they have a pretty strong effective nuclear charge. How come they don't have really high electronegativity values? Yeah, Meg. You got it. They ha already have a stable octet of electrons. They do not want to attract electrons to themselves. So. The relationship between effective nuclear charge and electronegativity is not a perfect one-to-one -one ratio. There are some exceptions. Noble gases have a very high effective nuclear charge, but do not have any electronegativity. Now here's the thing. I care less about these individual numbers, and I care more about the difference between two elements. Okay. For example, I'm going to give you two elements and I want you just to, you don't need a calculator, the numbers are easy. Subtract the numbers, give me the absolute value. What is the difference in electronegativity value between an oxygen atom and an oxygen atom? Zero! If something has an electronegativity difference of zero, what kind of bond is that? Nonpolar. Okay? Nonpolar. The electrons are being shared absolutely equally. Okay? How about the difference between nitrogen and oxygen? What's the number? Um, point 0.5. Point 0.5. How about carbon and oxygen? One. One. So. Which of those two bonds, NO or CO, which one, they're both polar covalent, which one is more polar? CO. Okay. How about boron and polonium? Polonium is in the bottom right. Boron and polonium. The difference is zero. Hmm. Okay, well if the difference in electronegativity is zero, what kind of bond is it? Non-polar. Non 
even though they're different elements, they have the same electronegativity. That's still a nonpolar bond. Okay? Now, um, here's the thing, okay? And I want you just to kind of hold your questions because I can guarantee I know some of the questions you're going to have. So just hold that thought. I'm going to answer it for you. Here's the gist. If the difference between these <coughs> electronegativity values is zero, that's a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay? You're never going to have, by the way, like two metals joined together, like magnesium and magnesium. Metals just don't do that. If the difference between those two numbers is intermediate, that's considered polar covalent. If the difference is very large, then it's ionic. Now, I know that some of you are thinking this. What kind of numbers? I mean, what kind of number is intermediate versus large? Like, where is this scale? It doesn't matter. Okay? Because some of you I know are going to be concerned and say, well, how do we know when something stops being polar covalent and starts being considered ionic? Well, how do you ever know if a compound is ionic or covalent? If it's a metal and a nonmetal, that's ionic. If it's two nonmetals, that's covalent. So here's the gist, okay? You will be able to very easily tell whether something is covalent or ionic. But I personally want you to know, because I think this is important, that there is a gradual change here. For example, okay, what is the difference between aluminum from this chart, aluminum and phosphorus? Aluminum and phosphorus. What's the number? 0.6. Guys, that's not a huge difference. That would fall, like, right in here. 0.6 is not a big difference between two elements. But, think about it. Aluminum, phosphorus. Is that ionic or covalent? Ionic. Why? How do you know that? Aluminum is a metal, okay? It's ionic, but here's the thing. Is it super duper ionic? No. There is something called covalent character versus ionic character. Aluminum phosphide is an ionic compound. Make no mistake, it is. However, it has some covalent character to it, okay? There is a gradual change here, okay? We're sharing electrons equally. We're not sharing equally. We're not sharing equally. We're not sharing equally. We're really not sharing equally. Now we're not sharing at all, okay? You can talk about compounds having a covalent character versus a, an ionic character. Okay. But again, let me make sure this is clear. If it's metal, nonmetal, it's ionic. If it's nonmetal, nonmetal, it's covalent. You, would be, you might be asked to compare two compounds. Like, for example, if I said aluminum and chlorine, Okay, what's the difference between, the number difference between aluminum and chlorine? 1.5. How about the difference between lithium and chlorine? So aluminum and chlorine versus lithium and chlorine. Two, okay. Think about this for a second. I want to make sure this is absolutely clear. Aluminum chloride, lithium chloride. Are those both ionic compounds, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Yes. Which one has a greater ionic character? Lithium chloride. Aluminum chloride is still an ionic compound, but it has a greater covalent character than lithium chloride. So Austin, you're never gonna be given just a number. You'll be asked to compare 
two things. Does that make sense? Austin? Okay. Okay. All right. This graph is just showing that very concept. The bigger the electronegativity difference, the greater the ionic character. Okay. You will not be asked to give just given one compound and said, does this have a high or low covalent character? You will be given two compounds and asked to compare them. So, what I would like for you to do is using that table in your book, I have given you five bonds here. I want you to put them in order from least polar to most polar. Go. All right, tell me this. This is quick. Which one of these is the least polar? Okay. What's next? What's next? Next? Okay. Tell me this. You're saying this one out of this group is the most polar. You're correct. Is it so polar that we would consider it ionic? No. No, why not? It's still two nonmetals. Okay. All of these are covalent, except for this one. The others are polar, but this one is the most polar. Okay. Um, and somebody last class asked a great question. Would I ever ask you something like this without this chart in front of you? Probably not. But because I, you know, don't expect you to know these numbers. But here's something I could ask you. If you look at your periodic table, what if I asked you to compare oxygen and fluorine, so O and F, there's a bond between those two, and carbon and fluorine, so OF versus CF. Which one is more polar? CF. You would know that without even having numbers in front of you, they're further apart on the periodic table, okay? Further apart means a greater difference in electronegativity, okay? Yes? So if you're gonna give us questions like that, it's going to be like obvious ones, not like the random? No, 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 no. No, I wouldn't give you like boron and polonium. I would never expect you to know that. You would simply say um, the carbon-fluorine bond, there's a greater difference in electronegativity between the elements than oxygen and fluorine. Okay? That's all you would have to say. A greater difference in electronegativity. Okay. So, this is the last topic we're going to discuss today. Okay. I want you all to be aware that when I finish this last section up here, at this point, we have not talked about how to draw Lewis structures. We have not talked about how to predict shape either. Okay? You don't need to know either of those things in order to understand this next section. Okay? So last class I got a lot of people saying, but how do we know what shape it is? Don't worry about that yet. We'll get to that, not today, but at some point. Here's the thing, guys. The last topic I want to discuss with you is not the polarity of a bond, which is what we've been talking about. Is this one bond polar or not? Instead, I want to get into talking about is this entire molecule polar or not? So what I mean is, like, if this is a giant molecule here, is one side of the molecule more negative and is the other side more positive? That's what a polar molecule means. And to answer that question, you need to ask yourself a question first. And I'm going to draw a molecule that does not exist. Just 
Understand that right off the bat. Just for example purposes. I'm not an artist. I'm trying to make this look as nice as possible. There. That is a molecule that does not exist. Tell me this. I give you a drawing like that and I say, is this molecule polar? Well, let me ask you a question. Does that molecule contain any polar bonds? Not a one. There are no polar bonds in this molecule. Every single one of these bonds is nonpolar. Ladies and gentlemen, a molecule cannot be polar unless it has polar bonds in it. Okay? But most of the ones we're going to look at are going to have polar bonds. Then you have to think about shape. Okay? So, let's talk about that. We are just going to scratch the surface of shapes. I am not expecting you to be able to predict shape yet. Okay? Let me give you an example here. I'm going to draw the structure for carbon dioxide. Okay, we're all exhaling it right now. Tell me this. Is this bond that I'm circling right here, is that a polar bond? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, it's two different elements. They're not going to share the electrons equally. That's a polar bond. However, the linear shape, because it's symmetrical, is canceling out those polarities. So ladies and gentlemen, this molecule as a whole is nonpolar. Here's the AP Chem lingo, are you ready? I have seen a couple of years back, I think, there was a question on free response that went something like this. Carbon dioxide contains polar bonds, but is itself a nonpolar molecule? Explain. Okay. You would say, although the molecule contains polar bonds, the linear shape cancels out the polarity of those bonds. Okay. I'll say it again. Remember, lingo is important here. Although this molecule contains polar bonds, the linear shape cancels out the polarity of those bonds. You're essentially saying the molecule is symmetrical, but you can't say that. Okay. So linear is a shape that does that. Here's another one. Trigonal planar. Okay. Like, here's a trigonal planar molecule. Okay. Is this a polar bond? Yes or no? Yes, but although this molecule contains polar bonds, the trigonal planar shape cancels out the polarity of the bonds. It's not impossible, and I'll show you an example in just a minute, but for the most part, yes. If it's symmetrical, it's going to be nonpolar. Here's another one you're probably familiar with. Tetrahedral, okay? Also a shape that cancels out the polarity of the bonds. And guys, I will tell you, and it, it kind of depends whether you took regular or honors or who you had as a teacher for Chem 1. Some classes learn the very basic shapes, like linear, bent, tetrahedral, trigonal planar. Some of you may have gone on to learn what are called extended shapes. We are all going to learn the extended shapes, and here is an example of one of them. I love that picture. It's called trigonal bipyramidal, and it is symmetrical. Isn't that a pretty picture? 
think it's nice. Nice three-dimensional rendering. Here's another one. Square planar, another symmetrical molecule. Trigonal bipure mold. And we will see these, we're going to get the model kits out next time, and we are actually going to physically build these. It'll be a lot easier to see if you've got it in front of you. Here's another one. I love this one. Octahedral. Okay. Folks, here is an example of a shape that will never cancel the polarity out. Never, ever. Like... This molecule, or water, also has this bent shape, okay? Is this a polar bond? Yes or no? Yep. But this shape does not cancel out the polarity of the bonds. So folks, bent molecules are always polar, always. There's something else that is always polar. Trigonal pyramidal, it's like a tripod. It is not symmetrical from top to bottom. So, this is our last slide. Here's what I want you to do. And let me say again, you do not need to remember how to draw Lewis structures. You do not need to have need to know how to predict shape. Okay? If you need the shape, I've given it to you. Okay? I want you to try to figure out are these molecules as a whole polar or not? Try it. Guys, I want you to be aware I am going to draw Lewis structures you don't have to draw Lewis structures in order to answer these. I am going to draw them just because I want you to start getting used to seeing them. But you don't have to draw them to answer these questions. is polar. That's all you have to say. You don't have to explain why it's polar. You just have to say that this molecule contains one bond and that bond is polar. Period. What about O2? Nonpolar. Okay. Very similar answer. This molecule contains only one bond and that one bond is Nonpolar. Okay. How about this molecule? CCL4. Nonpolar. Nonpolar. Now, I didn't give you the shape of this one, but I thought most of you could probably figure it out. What is the shape? Tetrahedral. Okay. Give me the AP Chem lingo. This has a different explanation than HINO2. All right, Chris, give it a try. Uh, 
Very good. Excellent. Okay. How about H2O? What do you think? Polar. polar. How would you say it in AP Chem Lingo? Although it contains polar bonds, the bent shape does not cancel out the polarity of the bonds. How about this one? Nonpolar. And ammonia? Polar. I'm going to throw you a curveball. Are you ready? Forgive me for not drawing in all the lone pairs. Okay, it is polar. Okay, does it contain polar bonds, yes or no? Okay, does it have a tetrahedral shape? Okay, well I thought tetrahedral shapes canceled out the polarity of the bonds. Okay. It's got to be the same elements. Ladies and gentlemen, these outside places, these are called terminal atoms. It always sounds so sad to me, like, like a cancer ward. It's terminal. No. Okay. These are terminal atoms. What do you think you call the one in the middle? Central. Okay. Although it's got polar bonds and the tetrahedral shape usually cancels out polarity, the terminal elements are not the same element, so it's polar. Okay. This situation does not come up very often, but I'm telling you that it does on occasion.